This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 93, recorded on July 30th, 2010. Hey everybody, it's Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, the podcast where we talk all about viruses the kind that may or may not make you sick. And joining me today to do that from Western MA is Alan Dove. Always a pleasure to be here. How's Western MA? Good? Today, absolutely gorgeous. Any any clouds up there? Oh, one or two passing us occasionally, mm. and uh, it's just you know, 78 degrees and moderate humidity. Just wonderful, wonderful weather for a change. Yeah, here this morning there were no clouds, but now they're moving on in. Uh. Let's find out what the weather is like down in north central Florida, where I think we might find Rich Condit. Here I am. Yes, indeed, in north central Florida. Hello, Vincent. Hello, Alan. Hello. Hello. Good to hear you. Yeah, you too. Yeah. Let's see. Were you with us last week? Of course. Uh, yes, I was with you last week. <laughs> Twice. Uh, where was it? Oh, yeah, we were at ASV. ASV well, it was Tuesday. a week and a half ago, actually. Yeah, but, uh, that's right. The week goes by. Holy yeah, cow. A lot has happened. Yeah, that and was fun. It is, in Florida, it is hot. I yeah. can't tell you exactly how hot, but uh, hot enough so that you really don't even want to know what the number is. Uh, we're in the middle of summer, you know? You've been all over the place, right, Rich? I have indeed. I just came back from a nice little sailing interlude in Buffalo. Is that good? Uh, with a gang I used to sail with that I haven't sailed with or seen in 20 years. It was amazing. It was great. Overnight race, 80 miles um, uh, from dusk until past dawn. Took us 15 hours, included sailing through a thunderstorm with, uh, you know, driving rain and six foot waves and 40 knot winds. Nice. Uh, so, yeah, that was fun. Did you take, any, wet. take any pictures? Uh, yeah, not in the race, but there's before and after yeah. shots. Because you were busy the whole time, pretty much? Uh, quite. Plus, oh, it was yeah. dark. And my iPhone. I don't take pictures with anything but my iPhone anymore. And it does not have a flash. When's that going to happen? Uh, the new one has a flash. Is that right? Yeah. Mm. If the Ford, uh, whatever, Ford. I right. thought Apple got rid of flash. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> they did. <laughs> they put an LED uh, on the back of the camera. All right. Um it's, I understand. I don't have one. But, I'll have to uh, wait. Still, taking pictures while you're at the helm is probably not a good idea. No, I kind of put it away and turned it off because I figured it really wouldn't be a pre it would be appreciated. The crew's supposed to be paying attention. Yeah. How many crew were there? Uh, we had eight guys. And uh, your, your, I'm sorry, your role was helm? Uh, no, my role was uh, what we call in the trade rail meat. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> I, you know, my skills are not up anymore, are not up to what these guys do. I was their regular spin, spinnaker handler uh, when I lived in Buffalo, but that was 20 years ago. And now I have to think twice before I, you know, wrap a rope around a winch, you know, think, mm. you know which which way does this thing go? So, uh, you know, I did a few kind That's of That's winch jobs. with an eye for you landlubbers in the audience. <laughs> I, uh, I, um... So it was, I did a few jobs where I could pitch in and otherwise tried to stay out of the way and provided uh, ballast uh, when we were healed over. You know? Nice. Well, lest anyone think that we're all not working, uh, I worked and I'm sure Alan worked this <laughs> Oh, week. yes. Yes, I've, I've been busy. All right. Well, today we have an all-email episode because they've been accumulating uh, since I think six months ago was our last one. And yeah, so uh, this is your show, listeners. You made it. and uh, But before we get on to that, we have a couple of brief things to chat about. Uh, this past week, we passed the half million download, download mark for TWIV. And that's only since episode 20. So thanks, everybody, for listening. Keep on listening. When we hit the million, I'll let you know. Should be uh, within the next year, I would guess. It's pretty good, guys, no? Yeah. Not bad. Really great. I mean, just think, half a million people want to, well, not people, but uh, half a million times people have listened to us talking about right. viruses. Yeah, it's remarkable. It's really great. Now, in the, in the scheme of podcasts, there are some that do much better, some that do that much every episode, I understand. But uh, I think it's pretty good for a rather technical subject. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a, a real niche uh, uh, broadcast. 
that's uh, quite that's a lot it. of listeners. Yeah, it is a niche, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. But it's a good one. So thanks, everybody, and keep it up. And the, the other thing we wanted to touch on was a topic that came up, I think, on TWIV89. We were discussing an approach to making an antiviral against Ebola virus. And we had a discussion about how it would probably never be developed because uh, there isn't enough need for it and the pharma companies wouldn't make money. And I don't know if you were on that episode. Were you, Rich? Uh, I was not, or I probably would have brought this up at the time. So you came up with some interesting stuff with something called BARDA. Right. So um, BARDA, let me get it here, is... Uh, I, should have, I should have remembered this too, yeah. BARDA is an acronym for the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, which is a uh, a branch or whatever of the uh, HHS, Department of health and human services. I know about this because I have a friend who works for them. And just reading from their website here, and we can put a link into the uh, show notes, it describes them as the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority within the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services provides an integrated, systematic approach to the development and purchase of the necessary vaccines, drugs, and therapy, therapies and diagnostic tools for public health medical emergencies. BARDA manages Project Shield, which includes the procurement and advanced development of medical countermeasures for chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear agents, as well as the advanced development and procurement of medical countermeasures for pandemic influenza and other emerging infectious diseases that fall outside the auspices of Project BioShield. So this agency was created, as I understand it, in response to the whole bioterrorism thing that was uh, basically started because of 9-11 followed very closely by the anthrax incident. And uh, the government decided that it really had to have some sort of uh, emergency plan, some planning, some contingencies in place, should there be a bioterrorist attack. Uh, that was the original incentive. And my sense is that it has morphed into something larger uh, to include emerging infectious diseases. Uh, and they have a, a specialty um, effort going on now, which is uh, pandemic influenza. So they describe themselves as having three basic projects. One is the thing they call CBRN, which is chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear agents. The other is pandemic influenza. The other is other emerging infectious diseases. And so what they do is they address exactly uh, what this uh, problem was, which is that they understand that we need drugs and vaccines for agents that uh, could be a very significant threat, but are not necessarily a current big threat. Uh, and things that big pharma or even little pharma might not have the resources or motivation or commercial interest to develop. Uh, and so they have, uh, they see a need, for example, there's some sort of mandate, I think, for like a vaccine and two antivirals for all of the class A agents, uh, smallpox, anthrax, botulism, several others that could be used as bioterror agents. And so they submit contracts and provide funding and review contracts uh, for these uh, big projects. Uh, I know about this, among other things, because of the smallpox uh, antiviral ST246 that's being developed by SIGA Technologies, and uh, it's all being done through HHS, which has granted them a significant amount of money to do this. Uh, but they also, if you look through their website, they talk about several different e efforts. There's one here that we can put a, uh, a link to from that's posted in a Center for Biosecurity, which I guess is at the University of Pen Pennsylvania, or I'm not sure. I've lost it right now. But anyway, any rate, I have the website here. But it talks about uh, contributions to um, anthrax. And in the last paragraph, addresses specifically what we were talking about. Uh, says, on September 30, 2008, NIAID and BARDA 
awarded two contracts for the development of a multivalent Ebola and Mar Mar Marburg vaccine to Crucell Holland and Integrated Biotherapeutics, Inc. Hmm. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, they're talking about $29.8 million with options to... Uh, to add forty point five million to a contract to one of them, another one is forty two point seven million. So this is big money. Well, they have this well, it's Go big ahead. money in basic research terms. It's moderate money in clinical research terms. Right. They have a stockpiling yes. program alone, right. at, which in fiscal year two thousand four got five point six billion dollars. Right. Just for stockpiling various that's for, things. Yeah, that's for buying supplies of stuff that already exists. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I guess the budget for this thing is quite big. Yep. Right. So we've talked several times before, for example, about the um, stockpiling of smallpox vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, the there's, a whole, there's a whole um, uh, sort of military industrial complex of biodefense that sprang up after 9-11 and the anthrax attacks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, exactly. This is a major part of it. What... Uh, your friend uh, is involved in what way? Advisory? Uh, he actually, this is, um, he, he had an academic career from yeah. which he retired and took up uh, uh, working with them. And he uh, reviews uh, applications for mm -hmm. funding. I see. Uh, he visits uh, laboratories uh, that are uh, conducting funded research. Uh, sort of site visits them, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Oh, that could be and, a lot uh, of fun. Yeah. He was also, when the uh, uh, influenza vaccine was being distributed, uh, he even spent part of his time uh, in places where the distribution was going on, making sure the inventory was correct. Nice. Okay? So he's done uh, all, all sorts of different uh, I stuff. I like that. So do we know how they decide what? So I guess that's, that's what his role is. They get proposals and they... And then they decide what to fund, right? Exactly. They have some kind of slate or agenda. They have some side of CES yeah. and uh, some sort of administrative protocol for reviewing these proposals and including site visits and et cetera and deciding uh, who gets funded for what. Mm. I had not known about this. So I suspect many listeners don't know, but you should go check it out because it's. Uh, yeah. And apparently, uh, I guess, apparently some scientists who might uh, want to uh, develop certain projects don't know about it either yeah check it out um, it's so government it's a money significant source yeah. of money yeah. it's your tax dollars go check it out that's right uh we met a guy at asv last uh, week who works at sega do you remember uh rich uh yes when, uh, I, I introduced you that? to him uh i don't know one night in the tent <laughs> right he's a former oh, that's student right. here yes 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 His name uh, is robbie uh, and i believe he's a listener and he was a former student here Mm -hmm. Maybe oh, Alan knows Robbie him. Allen? Yeah, exactly. Oh, wow. So what's he up to these days? So he did a postdoc, and then he got a job at SEGA. And I don't know where it is. Um, SEGA's know, in Corvallis, Oregon. Oregon. Yeah, so he's really enthusiastic and happy working there and uh, working on, I'm not sure what exactly, but uh, he's big time they into this They have done antiviral. a terrific job on the development of this antiviral ST246. Uh, and it's really a model for how to develop this stuff in this sort of uh, environment, including interfacing with the uh, government agencies. And as a matter of fact, one really significant challenge at this point is that you're talking about developing uh, antivirals for diseases where you can't really do trials in humans. Mm, yeah. And so the FDA has this, I believe it's called the animal rule, where uh, I believe the requirement is that a drug be shown efficacious in two different animal models, which as closely as possible mimic the disease. Uh, but nobody's ever successfully satisfied the animal rule, if I understand it correctly, in the eyes of the FDA. And I think SIGA's development of this smallpox drug has come as close as any. And so there's this dance going on between uh, SIGA and uh, the FDA to finally decide how what animal models are going to be satisfactory for proving as efficacious. And SIGA has provided all kinds of data in all sorts of animal models showing this thing to be efficacious but 
understandably, I guess the FDA is reluctant to say, okay, but they're going to have mm, to, sure. because you can't try You can't do the trials in humans for these things. Yeah. Well, you can do safety things, but you cannot tr do efficacy. Right. It has to be. Exactly. Exactly. You know, real life. So that's great. And this is a nice uh, story for listeners. This fellow was a PhD student in this department and now is working at this small company. And uh, he loves it. He's very excited. He loves what he's doing. In fact, when the we company were... is also developing uh, uh, antivirals to a number of other yeah. agents. The big question for their future is: Okay, once SD two forty six is done, that now is. what? Yeah, <clears throat> not easy. Uh, yeah, we're we'll not see. saying no, it's, it's easy. Not easy. There was a company in Bozeman uh, also working on various viral vaccines, a small biotech. They were they were bringing people out one day you know, for tours of the facility. So. Uh, there is some of this, and if you want to do that, it's available, all of you who are training. So anyway, Rich, thanks for picking that up, and uh, I'm glad you listened to the episodes that you're not on. <laughs> it's good. So that is a great find. I like that. All right, let's move on to some email. The first one is from Joyce, who writes, Love the podcast. I once went into a very large bookstore. Of course, there aren't any many more large bookstores left <laughs> in the U.S., right, and asked the clerk if they had any books on parasitology. She said they did and pointed me in the direction of a large case of colorful books, which on closer examination turned out to have titles such as Unbelievable Investigations into Ghosts, Area 51 Revealed, and Recalling a Past Life, Nothing About Ascarids or Mosquito-Borne Disease. Oh, well. It is wonderful to hear people who are enthusiastic about the history and future of their special fields. I listen to both TWIV and TWIP. I am decidedly a non-scientist. My science education consists of closely reading the, la the last three editions of the Merck Veterinary Manual and raising livestock for most of my life. I appreciate any references to remedial reading sources in virology and parasitology. As a non-scientist, I would love more information about lab procedures and technology. How do you extract a protein? What is involved in setting up a lab? How have these things changed? Keep up the excellent work, gentlemen, and could you scare up a few more gentle women scientists? Joyce is from Washington. We will scare up more gentle women yes, scientists. Yes, we need so to do that. We had yeah. two uh, last week, and we have one coming up in uh, two weeks. Yeah, we will work harder. Let's this see. How do you extract a protein? Who wants to answer how to extract a protein? Well, the first thing you need is a way to detect your protein. Yeah. Um, so you have an assay of some kind, and uh, you set that up. You make sure that it works on some kind of uh, raw sample. And then you um, – it's almost embarrassing how crude and empirical this process is. You try essentially try different things and see what keeps your protein intact and separates out other bits of the uh, of the cell uh, that you're working with. Um, there are some standard procedures that people use. You can use uh, uh, detergents and other chemicals to break up the cell membrane. Um, you can uh, um, centrifuge things to separate objects of different masses. Um, and see where your protein comes out, and then sort of the backbone of protein protein purification, if you really want to purify the thing, uh, is something called liquid chromatography, um, where you take your your gamish of cell parts that contain your protein, and you put them uh, through um, a tube that's full of little beads with some kind of chemical coating on them. There are different sorts of chemical coatings you can put on these. Uh, some of them will stick to your protein. Some of them will stick to other things and not stick to your protein. And so you run these liquid extracts through the beads, and um, you extract your protein using these these purification resins, they're called. Um, and then you take either the beads or the portion that flowed through um, and check and see if your protein is in there. And then proceed from there. Often you run more uh, columns of these resins and sequentially isolated. Um, that's sort of the, uh, the very simplified version. There's a whole lot of high technology that can be applied to that as well. Yeah, as you talk and I, and I visualize this, um, it occurs to me that what you're doing is sort of you start off with a whole cell extract that is 
broken cells, and then you, using the techniques that you described, selectively throw stuff away. Mm. Right. Until the only thing that's left is the protein that you're interested in. Right. We say that you're enriching the solution for your protein. Right. So you're, uh, you're throwing away the stuff that's not your protein, and you're trying to keep most of your protein in the solution. And as you rightly point out, the assay is absolutely critical to this. You have to have some way to detect the protein that you're really interested in. Yes. Now, if you happen to have the gene encoding the protein you're interested in, then it becomes a little simpler. You could, um, so you could take a DNA, a, a copy of the gene in a plasmid, for example, and express or produce your protein in bacteria or other cells. And uh, you can attach to the protein a, a, an amino acid sequence, what we call a tag, which is jargon, but it could be detected with something else, like an antibody. So that really facilitates purifying your protein. If you can stick a tag onto it at the DNA level, uh, then you can purify it a lot quicker. And there are ways to do that that involve columns or centrifugation as well. I think that's pretty good, right? Yeah, I wanted to add one thing yep. to this just for kicks and talk about, because this is a one of the things that got me interested in science early on, a description of a certain kind of column chromatography that was given to me by my first mentor as an undergraduate, Harry Noller, uh, who described gel filtration. So in more technical terms, gel fil a gel filtration is one of these columns that Alan described filled with uh, beads that are a certain relatively large size, but they're porous. They got little pores in them. And so if you stick down a mixture of molecules in this, uh, molecules that can are small enough to stick in the pores, get hung up in the pores, and so come out of the column more slowly. Molecules that are too large to go in the pores go between the beads, and so they're going through less volume, and they come out very fast. So it's a molecular sieve where large stuff comes out first and small stuff comes out last. It separates on the basis of uh, mass or shape or combination of the two. And Harry described this to me. He said, it's, it's like this. You got your protein is a mixture of adults and kids, and the resin, the column, is a forest and you send the adults and the kids running through the forest and the adults come out first because the kids climb the trees. It's great. <laughs> I like it. That's really good. <laughs> um, all right. You, you just said it. So it's down. You have to write that down somewhere. That's great. <laughs> I like that. That's great. All right. Um, how do you set up a lab? Wow. So I was thinking about this and, uh, I'll let you, I'll let you chime in too rich, but, um, so all of us who want to set up academic labs, let's say university or college labs, we've done postdoctoral work. So we know what we want to work on more or less and what equipment we need. So we, we get a job offer, and along with the job offer for some kind of professorial position, you get some money to set up your lab. So what I did, I, I showed up here at Columbia. I had an empty room, which was part of the deal, a lab. And I sat down and just started ordering what I needed. They had given me some money to order stuff. And uh, so I ordered stuff. And then I looked for a technician to help me do research. I put ads in the paper. I interviewed people. Eventually, eventually the equipment came in and the technician came in. And we started working. We set it up. But it took about three months to, before I did my first experiment. And uh, eventually some students joined the lab and it got bigger and bigger and that's how you do it. So and now the funny thing is that we're hiring new people here in my department. They're on my floor. I see them doing exactly the same thing. Right. They're sitting in their office and the boxes are coming into the lab. <laughs> Doesn't change very much. Well, the interesting thing is that nobody, nobody ever teaches you specifically how to set up a lab. Yeah. But you work in labs for, you know, years before – it's actually your responsibility to set one up. Uh, and so basically what you do is you go into this empty space, as you say, and try and replicate uh, the spaces that you have grown up in. And you know that you know that you need to have certain equipment and certain supplies to do this and people to help you do it. You go in with an idea and then you order the stuff uh, you need to try and implement that idea. An important part of this is 
since nobody really does explicitly train you to do this, you got to pay very close attention during your training and perhaps keep in mind that someday you may be expected to replicate this. <laughs> and so uh, when it comes to operating a piece of equipment or something like like that or ordering something or deciding what to order, pay attention instead of just letting somebody else do it all because someday you may have to do it. I like this document you sent us, Rich. I'll tell you where, okay, so this is a document called What is a PhD? <laughs> and I'll tell you the origin of this. Um, I did a, so I set up my own lab in 1978. I did a sabbatical, uh, and that was in Buffalo, and I did a sabbatical uh, at MIT and uh, Phil Sharp's lab in 1986. And I came back, uh, I guess, thinking I was kind of a big shot. <laughs> <laughs> and expecting a lot of my students and all that kind of stuff. And they were wonderful. They came to me one day and they said, look, uh, we know that we are a bunch of clowns, uh, but be patient with us, okay? And make sure that your expectations are clear. And I said, oh, okay. I need to make sure my expectations are clear. And so I sat down and I thought about what really the expectations are, are, are and what, what is a PhD, really? What, do you, what should you do? And so this was after, what, uh, not even 10 years of independent experience, but I've kept the document alive since then, editing it now and then. Um, and so it describes my, based on my experience, what I think a PhD ought to be able to do, which is starts out go into an empty lab with nothing but a pencil and paper and create a viably extra, a viable externally funded research program that requires that, that, that this requires that the PhD be able to do several things. I don't know if you want to go through all this, but it's got 11 different steps. I like, um, uh, a bunch I, of comments. I think it's great. We're going to post it if that's okay with you. Sure. Absolutely. I like this one that says here, um, and I'm sure Alan likes this. Hints and comments. Assume everybody is a jerk, including yourself. Everybody knows the boss is a jerk. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and then, but one I, I do object to is way at the end, profanity and ethnic slurs are strictly forbidden. I agree with the ethnic slurs, but I hear profanity all the time. Uh, well, to tell you the honest truth, uh, that was a tongue-in-cheek phrase. Okay. There. <laughs> Good. Because uh, profanity is, um, uh, it's well understood that it's, um, terms of endearment that we use yeah. with each other this that is... other people might regard as profane. But I, uh, I do agree uh, the ethnic, ethnic slurs is not a joke. I think this is terrific. I wish I'd had this when I started my lab. I'm giving it to my students. And you we're going to post it on the it show notes if you want. You I'm going to post uh, it on the show notes. I'd like to make a blog post out of it too by you. Sure. Go, uh, go ahead. Because I think everyone needs to see this. It's got tongue in cheek in it, but it's got some good stuff as well. You know, I, I handed out something, but it was so serious that no one really paid attention to it. <laughs> so I think you need to mix the humor in, which is what we do here on Twiv. Yeah. And uh, this bit about. Uh, this bit about assume that everybody's a jerk, including yourself. This shows up a couple of times in this. I think we could probably do a whole twiv on the role of ego in science. Oh yeah, right. Yes, because we've we've talked about this before uh, amongst ourselves, and I don't know how much on twiv, but I think although you've said Vincent before that it it has been said that ego drives science, and I can't I can't disagree with that. I regard that as uh, largely unfortunate because I think the best science is done driven by pure curiosity in the absence of ego. And when your ego gets in the way, it impedes your ability to objectively evaluate what's going on. So I think you have to, you have to assume that, that everybody's a jerk, including yourself. Don't believe what anybody tells you. Ask to see the data, right? Yeah. No, this is fabulous. I'm, I think this is terrific, and it's is how. Look at this is a listener asking a question, and look what we got at. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're never going to get through all of this email, by the way. That's <laughs> uh, all right. I wanted That's to okay. just I wanted to add that the um, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute also has a, a book which is called How to Set Up a Lab or How How to Start a Lab or something like that. I think it's online. I'm going to try and find the link, and I'll put it. If I find it, I'll put it in the show notes. 
It's something I know. There's a paperback version that circulates around. It's got some interesting stuff in it, but it's all serious, of course. I think Riches is really good because this is a grassroots thing, right? It just kind of is organic. It developed over the years. Actually, one of the things uh, one of the things that the uh, writer asked was, "How has this changed over the years?" And to start off with, that first paper that I uh, the first sentence that I read, a properly trained PhD should be able to go into an empty lab with nothing but a pencil and paper and create a viable externally funded research program. That's changed. When I started, it was literally a pencil and paper. <laughs> now you'd go in with a laptop. That's yes. right. <laughs> That's changed quite a bit. Yeah. And yeah. it's changed our ability to do all kinds of things with information, obviously. And also not just research, but to teach it. Teaching has changed, but that's a different topic. All of these things are our entire episodes, actually. All right. So yeah, we better get on, otherwise we don't. Um, so well, yeah, we can this, do it I think this next. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I think this next letter will probably be reasonably quick. Yeah. So who would like to read that? Rich, can you do that one? Okay. So this is Peter writes. Since I last emailed you, I've been able to ascertain that there is a program to zero survey imported captured. Uh, terapid, is that how I pronounce that? I terapid guess. fruit bats held in American facilities, e.g. zoo, for example, zoos, etc., which is being facilitated through the Luby Bat Conservancy's, Conservancy's Allison Walsh and CDC's Tom Kaizak. As far as a survey of Native and South American and Caribbean bats, nothing is apparently known yet on the status of uh, Hanipa viruses, but John Epstein from the Consortium for Conservation of Me uh, Conservation Medicine in New York advises that they have received funding from the NIH to survey native New World bats for unknown and known viruses, including Hanipa viruses, in a program to be headed by Peter Daszak. Let me know when you're planning to do the show. And I'm only too happy to talk with you on Skype. Keep up the good words. Kind regards, Peter. Yeah, so this is an old uh, email, actually. Peter is the equine veterinary surgeon who was involved with the outbreak uh, of um, an unknown virus back in 94 in Brisbane, Australia. And it caused, so he said so it infected racehorses and killed them. And that was now, uh, that was called Hena Hendra virus. And he had emailed us a long time ago. And, uh, I said, we should do an episode, and he said he'd be happy to join us, so we'll get him on one of these days. Yeah. But, of course, now there are a lot of bat uh, surveys going on. Right. Of course, we've talked about them with Eric here on TWIV. So I just wanted to clear out that one from the queue. Peter, if yeah. you're still listening, we'll get you on. You can. T that would be great to hear his story I, of I how think it, it would happened. Be, I think it would be terrific, yeah. Right? I'd love to hear that. All right, next one, Alan. Okay, Jamie writes, hello everyone. Uh, first, I want to say that you truly add an educational ray of sunshine to my day. I'm an animal technician with a reputable university, and fortunately, we're allowed to listen to iPods while we work. I discovered TWIV via TWIP. I have to add, I would most definitely appreciate more frequent TWIPs. The length of the podcast gets me through my morning of checking and changing, and then I move on to iTunes U courses. Um, I do have a question, or rather a request. One of the rooms I work in is considered biohazard level 2, BL2. The posting on the door reads, Hazardous Agents, Influenza, Adenovirus, Lentivirus. After listening to all the TWIVs, I feel I understand influenza. However, I don't know much about adenovirus and lentivirus. As an animal technician, I try to solicit information from the investigators about their study so that I can be sure the animals get the utmost care. I know what side effects to be prepared for, particularly with this lab's mice. I guess I'm looking for the why. Of course, these vir viri, he says, uh, may or may not have to do with the side effects I'm mindful of, but I wholeheartedly appreciate any insight. Keep up the uh, titillizing podcasts. Is that a word? Titillating. Interesting podcasts. I look forward to them. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd like to know what adeno and lentes are, I guess, right? right. Well, adenovirus... Uh, first of all, I as more or less assume that um, in this particular circumstance, well, I don't, I don't, that he might be looking at, uh, there might be experiments going on using adeno and lentiviruses as vectors to introduce uh, genes or express proteins in the animals and et cetera. But uh, adenovirus, as far as human disease is concerned, is a, 
Uh, double stranded DNA containing virus, uh, medium sized genome, about 36 kilobases. That's enough for about 36 genes. Icosahedral naked virus that causes a variety. There's uh, over 100 serotypes in humans and causes a variety of illnesses, mostly uh, respiratory infections, also conjunctivitis um, and gastroenteritis. It's a not a real serious infection except in uh, immunocompromised people, but it's also used uh, crippled versions of adenovirus are a very common uh, vector for gene therapy and expressing uh, foreign proteins in various animals. My guess is that that's mostly what's going on in these labs. Lentivirus, what, HTLV1 and 2? HIV. Uh, HIV. HIV. Okay, um, so I don't know what kind of experiments might necessarily be going uh, on in a BSL, in a BSL two level laboratory. It's most likely uh, vector work. Lentiviruses are quite commonly used as vectors, and once again, these will be uh, crippled entities. So we're talking about uh, revert, uh, retroviruses, right? Uh, Single stranded yeah. RNA genome in a capsid that's uh, enveloped and enters and is reverse transcribed and most importantly the reverse transcribed cdna copy of the rna is integrated into the genome so those become ideal gene therapy vectors because you integrate a copy that would be expressed permanently and so they're very efficient at uh making cell lines that um, uh, express proteins and I introducing genes into animals and etc so the lentis are HIV, SIV, feline, ovine, not, not HTLVs. That's a different okay. group. I, I would agree. I think they're probably used as vectors, but we shouldn't rule out the possibility that some people are maybe infecting animals with adenoviruses. It's not likely. To study the pathogenesis yeah. of the virus itself. Yeah, it could even be for some lentis as well. Sure. But So if that's the case, they are infectious viruses, and they could spread... So you would have to use containment. But as you said, the vectors are typically crippled. So, you know, we don't know what it's being used for, but those are the two possibilities. I think it's uh, worth pointing out that uh, BSL-2 is a relatively low-level security. Um, and if they're usually in a, in a facility like this, if, if there's uh, at, at the BSL-2 level of security if there are specific hazards involved uh, that, uh, for example, require immunization or something like that, then those will be posted. And if there's any significant risk of uh, people becoming uh, infected, then it's going to be something other than BSL-2 or there'll be specific restrictions posted. So right. the assumption is that nobody's, by uh, walking through and taking care of animals, nobody's going to get sick from this. Yeah, right. this is this is not uh, the the spacesuit lab that you see in the Hollywood movies. That's right. BSL four, right. and it's not even the uh, gown up and shower beforehand and afterward. Exactly, you can walk in and out BSL of these laboratories, and it's no big and it's yeah. no big deal. My lab well, is fact, a, my, yours is BSL two. Yeah, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, mine is BSL two. Yeah, uh, with the added restriction that uh, if there's virus work actually going on in the laboratory, you uh, have to. Uh, have a smallpox vaccination to enter. Okay. So it's BSL we're, 2 plus, we're, we're, right? Yeah. So we're pretty strict about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. What did I just. Okay. All right. The next one is from Ken, who writes During episode 87, Vince and Graham both used a word that microbiologists have been urged to purge from their vocabularies prokaryote. The initiative is from Norman Pace, a pioneer of molecular microbial ecology. Pace argues persuasively, in my opinion, that while the word eukaryote can be used to refer to a phylogenetically coherent group of organisms, prokaryote cannot. Using the word can mislead students into thinking that cellular life is divided into two main groups. And he gives us a link to an essay. It may seem silly, but it's a good lesson in thinking phylogenetically. Actually, I agree, and I just slipped but I do try, I've do. i taught in my courses that you shouldn't use prokaryote any longer. Um, and in fact, there is a very good article that I will also link to by Patrick Fortier where he explains this. And according to him, the prokaryotic concept 
which is that bacteria are prokaryotes because they don't have a defined nucleus or one, a nuclear membrane, proposed in 1962, still functions as a paradigm for most biologists more than 30 years after it was shown to be wrong in 1977, thanks to the work of Carl Weiss and colleagues. And he basically sequenced ribosomal RNAs, I believe, and found that um, you should have three lineages, eubacteria, archaea bacteria, and eukaryotes, which was then changed to archaea and bacteria and eukaryotes. So there are three primary lineages. And I, I do teach my students, but I slipped with Graham. So and apologies. just uh, you know, to let you know how long it takes for these perceptions to change, this may have been proven to somebody's satisfaction in the 1970s, but in 1990, I took a course in the graduate program in Columbia's microbiology department called Prokaryotic Molecular Biology. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll tell you, I so, tried this. I tried this out on a couple of friends of mine and got a serious pushback. Really? Saying, wait, yeah, saying, wait, wait, wait a minute. You know, huh. eukaryotes have nuclei; prokaryotes don't. Blah blah. blah you know, so they were well. And pretty adamant. part of the part of the problem, uh, taxonomists kind of bring this on themselves because if you ask two taxonomists their opinion, you, you'll get six opinions. Um, <laughs> You, you just there are things constantly being reclassified at the lower levels. So when a taxonomist tells you, "Oh no, there are three kingdoms of life now," you say, "Uh, yeah, right. I'll believe it in twenty years." Um, Interesting. So there's, I, I think, a lot of biologists kind of have a habit of saying, "Well, you know, taxonomy is a little wishy-washy," um, and really, you know, these are artificial categories that we've imposed. Sure. So if I understand this. Um, Correctly, Vincent, the idea here then is that really the genomics takes precedence over what had been used as sort of a cytological classification of things. Yeah, right? exactly. And, it turned out that Weiss found that when you compare the ribosomal sequences, that the uh, bacteria, the archaea, are no more related to bacteria than they are to eukaryotes in terms and, of their ribosomes. And neither archaea nor bacteria have nuclei, right. so you can't really use that as a primary classification. Right. So if you make them both prokaryotes, it's absurd on the basis right. of the sequence. So they said, let's make three. And that makes, okay. to me, it makes good sense. And in sure. fact, Alan, the course is now called Microbial Molecular Biology. Good, good. <laughs> so at some point, we did come around. And I'm sorry that when Graham said it, I knew it was wrong, but I didn't want to correct them. You know, sometimes you don't want to interrupt the flow of conversation because we would have talked about it for 15 minutes probably <laughs> yes i will probably never get over saying prokaryote so you're just going to have to excuse me that's all right or or correct me repeatedly <laughs> yeah that's okay and then uh, ken sends a joke which he says the best virus joke is attributed to comedian brian malo a virus walks into a bar the bartender says we don't serve viruses in this bar the virus says now you now we do there you go all right, yes. thank you, Ken. Uh, next one is from Sophie Allen. Is that your turn or Rich's I'll turn? I'll take it. You can take it. Um, Sophie writes, hello to all the great people on TWIP, to, to all the great TWIV and TWIP people. I listened to the ER TWIV, uh, that's endogenous retroviruses, and the question about why we don't have any active ER viruses. Could it be because our immune systems are more active or better than, than for example, a hen's? I'm aware that this probably wouldn't explain the difference between us and other mammals, but could the differences between our immune systems be big enough? Uh, at last but not least, I would like to thank you for telling me about Drobo. It's exactly what we need, especially school notes and pictures. Just too bad that the promotion code doesn't work for us Danes. You know, when I saw ER, I thought they meant the TV show. Right. She, yeah, it took me a little while to. Yes. ERV. Uh, so you sent this on to Welkin, right? Yeah. yeah. Hey, you can so, go so ahead. So Welkin, Welkin replies, my first reaction is that our immune systems should be no better or worse. But then there's the caveat that most active herbs, ERVs, uh, probably come from heavily domesticated or inbred animals, chickens and mice. So maybe there's something to it. Not worse, but less diverse. Perhaps another purely speculative possibility is behavioral. Humans recently developed weapons and cooking, so could we be less likely to come into direct physical contact with infectious retrovirus-containing material from other species? A tangential but similar question that has bothered me for some time is why are there no known retroviruses of dogs? 
Cats have several, so do humans, horses, cows, mice, chickens, and sheep. Why not dogs? Which is mm. a very interesting observation. So, importantly, uh, an expert on this subject doesn't have a satisfactory answer. Okay? Yes. I mean, he's got a lot of speculation. It's <laughs> not that, uh, well, his answer is satisfactory, but it doesn't answer, you know, he doesn't know the answer to the question. Yeah. Right. right. He's got a lot of ideas. Right. Not a silly question, Sophie. This no, is some absolutely not. <laughs> Yeah, what so, comes to my mind is that I think we're looking, it's important to keep in mind that we're just looking at a snapshot. Exactly. Evolution. Yes. Okay. And we don't know what it's going to be like a hundred million years from now. Right. Uh, right. We do know that there was a hell of a lot going on in humans uh, millions of years ago because we have the fossil record in our genomes to testify to it. So are there no endogenous retroviruses in dogs? That's right. That's what he says. Well, he says Absolute there are no known, known retroviruses yeah. of dogs. Not even any herbs. I have I have a hard time believing that. Do we have a complete wolf sequence? <laughs> I don't know. Good question. That's, that's the relevant um, comparison. I mean, domestic dogs have been inbred and re-outbred and all sorts of bred um, for just a vast array of traits. So you look at the diversity of a chihuahua and a rottweiler, um, it, it may just be that there's been so much recombination and rearrangement going on there that maybe we can't see them in the domestic dogs. So it says, I found a paper in uh, Retrovirology. In silico analysis of the dog genome identifies canine endogenous retroviruses. Ah, good. Ah. So they have endogenous ones, but they don't have exogenous retroviruses. That we know of. That we know of. They might be out there, sure. But now, wait a minute. That same paper suggests that well, I was looking. I was looking at the um, just the the Google excerpt. The Google excerpt. The dog may well have been effective in protecting its genome from integrations of most types of endogenous retroviruses, compared to mouse, chimpanzee, yeah. and dot dot dot. So it sounds like maybe they have less. Or they something have like only four hundred and sixteen, which is a fifth of the amount found in the human genome. Okay. So they have fewer. You know, right. the dogs is, is a funny thing because they're one species. All dogs are one species, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. Well, but cats, domestic cats. So one, one species as well. Okay. Um, but I don't know if he was referring to just domestic cats. I don't know if uh, tigers or leopards or whatever uh, have been looked at. Yeah. Anyway, good question. Great yeah. question. Sorry about the Drobo, Sophie. Yeah. <laughs> maybe on another, on another ad campaign. Jim writes... Will the I'm sorry, Rich, go no, ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Will the iPad change the way you teach and communicate by allowing textbooks that incorporate interactive apps, motion, audio files, games, and faster, more frequent revisions? Will use of the touch screen devices such as the iPad improve sanitation by promoting cleaner hands? Will the iPad represent sand or pebbles? You guys remember that sand or pebbles? Uh is this is this the uh filling a bucket with Sand or pebbles or whatever. Ah, oh, gosh, now I've forgotten. Um, so <laughs> I have uh, I have been told that uh, in order to um, sort through all of the tasks that one encounters in one's life um, and prioritize them, uh, you have to think of it as you have a bunch of uh, sand and pebbles and different size rocks and you have a bucket uh, that can only hold so much stuff and if the bigger size rocks represent the more important tasks the important thing is to put them in first and there's always room for some sand in between the cracks but if you fill the whole bucket up with mm. sand the unimportant stuff you'll never get the rocks in so if it's a reference to that, then it's talking about the relative importance yeah. of the uh, iPad. Google I've is also completely uninformative on this issue. Now, oh, this, yeah? is, this is one of our episodes we uh, likened. Dis I think we likened Discovery to either Sand or Pebbles. I don't remember. Ah. But, Jim, tell us, because it's uh, when I read your, your email, which was about a month ago— <laughs> I got it, but now I've forgotten because I don't remember the episode. I've also been told that once you've uh, stuck in all of the sand and the pebbles, that there's always room for beer. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I believe that's a complete recipe for concrete. <laughs> Great. Um, if we had transcript, you know, we could just be searching them right now, but right. we don't. Anyway, I think, um, yeah, I think this is going to change, and, and not just the iPad, but all the pads that are going to come out in the next year. 
are going to change everything. Yeah, sure. I agree. And uh, I'm frankly, uh, I'm a fan of the hygiene hypothesis. So I'd rather not improve sanitation by promoting cleaner hands. You know, I think we need to eat dirt. <laughs> There's a uh, new podcast called iPad Today, and I was listening to it the other day. And they said they were in a restaurant where they gave out, was it a restaurant? Yeah, they gave out iPads menu for menus and other things to do while you're oh, waiting wow. for your food. But they said they got really greasy and dirty, so mm. they didn't think that was a good idea. So I my iPad gets very dirty, greasy. Because it's handled by everyone, it sits on the table and people pick it up. So I don't think it will improve it. But as as Rich says, it's probably good not to improve it. Uh, also, I have this vision of people sitting uh, sitting at restaurants across from each other at the table, just playing with their iPads the whole time, rather than yeah, rather talking. than talking. Well, I see that already with Blackberries, people yeah, sitting there. And I'm guilty of a little of that myself. What do you think about iPads and uh, stuff, uh, Alan? Like, oh, uh, sorry, I was doing something else. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I'm a well. I'm a chronic late adopter for things like this. Um, so you know whether this is going to change science and publishing and everything that's been hyped for. I I really um, mm. uh, I'll I'll wait and see. Um, yeah, it's a very promising looking device, but I I can't tell you whether it's sand or pebbles at this point. I'll I, tell you, I was at this uh, virus structure and assembly meeting, and there was a guy there, uh, a, a graduate student uh, in. Uh, from Rossman's lab, who I talked with quite a bit. Every time I asked him a question, first thing he did was bring out his iPad. Okay, and he had an article or a website or something, and it was it was his it was his tool for everything. Wow, that's quick. Yeah, it was amazing, and it was it was really impressive to see how he used it. He used all of the things that we uh, talked about. You had a who was it you had on that we talked about a. Uh, an iPad, the um, Futures yeah, Biotech. Mark Pelletier, yeah. yeah. And he had a bunch of suggestions as to how to implement certain yeah. tasks on the iPad, and these were all being used by this guy. It was pretty amazing. I, I mean, for my textbook, I want it to be on the iPad, and I wanted there to be movies, movies of virus structures, links, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. into, and we can update it, can be interactive. I think this will be great, but I do think it's going to take a long time for it to get there. Because... And the thing I'm wary of with this is... Um, the ability to do something, it, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, and what we saw, I think the example most people have seen most clearly is the evolution of the web. Um, you know, if you saw a website in 1995, you could make text blink and flash. And, you know, now you can have animated graphics of all sorts and pop-ups. And, and yes, you can do all of this with the technology. But if it's not actually serving what you're trying to communicate, then it's bad. Yeah. Um, and I think there's an enormous temptation when people get involved with, with this sort of thing, you know, interactive books. Oh my gosh, we can animate this, that, and the other. And the examples you just gave were great. Having, having an animated virus structure that you could rotate, for example, and interact with and, and turn, or that turns as you highlight different portions of the text so that it highlights different areas. That could be great. Uh, on the other hand, you know, somebody who puts a little, a little dancing guy in the corner just for the heck of it, that's not so great. <laughs> I agree completely. You see this a lot in PowerPoint presentations. Oh, PowerPoint is the put, worst offender, yes. People put in a lot of super, superfluous stuff, and and uh, this just a distraction, especially and, the backgrounds. You know, putting these fancy backgrounds so you can't read the text. And I think the impact of this on science and on and on teaching is going to be dependent on how well and how quickly um, the textbook authors and the and the instructors and and the researchers um, understand how to communicate with it rather than just understanding how to play with it right yeah like everything else there'll be tasteful implementations and less tasteful ones yes and you know the web has evolved to now there are a lot of good sites that are well done and useful right and, and what are there 75 uh, farting applications for the iPhone <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> you know this is I don't think it's bad. I think people need to do right. I wasn't you know? criticizing that. I was just pointing it out. <laughs> like, but you have to <laughs> Gee, know. I only have I only have fifteen of those. <laughs> I didn't know that there were seventy five. Okay, so uh, Rich, why don't you do uh, sure. the next one? Chris writes, "Dear Doctors Racniello and De Pommier, 
I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time to make my birthday gift possible via Dr. Gene Lim. It meant more than you can possibly imagine to have so many people take the time out of their schedules over something so silly as a 23rd birthday. I know even as a first-year graduate student, I find that time seems to be the resource that dries up most quickly, and it's very inspiring to someone who is just beginning to dream of spending their life in science to have those way ahead of them take the time to lend a hand on the way up. I know you get this sort of feedback a lot by email, but perhaps there is never too much. Thanks for taking the time to do TWIV. It's proven to be so much more than great entertainment while working out at the gym. I love the way they keep getting longer, too. I'm doing much longer workouts so I can finish listening. But has really helped me to challenge my professors actively in virology and pathogenesis, which I think they like even more than I do. Also, some of the stories and ideas you bring up on TWIV have helped fuel entire science discussions over food and beer between groups of graduate students and postdocs here. We all follow TWIV compulsively, ha ha, which is where I think all the best thinking is done. I appreciate the time and effort you both and Dr. Dove and Dr. Condit and guest of the week do to help make our training experience so much fun, and I hope it shall continue for future students for a long time. Chris. So that's very nice. That's really nice. You know this story about uh, the birthday gift, right, Vincent? Yes. Yeah, so Dr. Dr. Jean Lim uh, had emailed me and asked me to uh, have Dixon autograph a copy of his book, West Nile Story, for Chris for his birthday. She said, don't tell him. Don't read this letter until I give it to him. So I got Dixon to sign it. We sent it, and everyone's happy. So that's great. Chris, cool. Chris is at the NIH, too, so that's good. I'm glad that there's a cadre of TWIV listeners there. That's great. Yeah. Uh, Peter writes, Dear TWIV hosts, this includes Rich, since I am not regarding him as a guest anymore. <laughs> this is a bit no, old. he lives here now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a bit old. What a week. So he goes through a couple of podcasts he listened to for the week, and he has four news items. We'd like to hear discussed by you if you haven't done so already. Some of them we have. One, uh, an interview with Harriet Robertson, Robinson, Senior VP Geovax Labs on a combined new two-component HIV vaccine. We didn't discuss that. I don't know offhand what are the two components. Anyone know? I know she's, uh, a I DNA. Know. she's into DNA immunization, so I'll bet that's right. one component. Right. Her standard, the standard has been a uh, DNA prime i believe what uh well one of them's prime one of them's boost and it's uh dna is one and the other is a uh, vaccinia recombinant expressing this or that right. uh, hiv protein so whether this is a new spin on that or not i don't know two mark chrislip from the most recent pus cast for the first two weeks of march he's talking about rinderpest as being a potential candidate for the second eradicated infectious disease, but did you discuss the relationship to measles? So I think we talked about this a while ago, that rinderpest may be eradicated soon. And I think we've also talked about the possibility that it was a uh, precursor of measles. So rinderpest is a cattle pathogen, and it is thought that it went from cattle to humans when agriculture began, I don't know, 15,000 years ago, and we started raising cows, and so we got their viruses. I think we've talked about that on Twitter. Right. And then he says, as a German, of course, I like you using German words like Schmutzdecke and Rinderpest. <laughs> Good. <laughs> we haven't used Schmutzdecke in a while. Can you say great that, word. Rich? Schmutzdecke. Yeah, great he's, word. He's good at it. I should have known the origin of the name of toll-like receptors, but I learned it from Twiv. Don't ask me why, but I always associate it with highway toll gates. <laughs> That's great. Number three, vaccine delivering mosquitoes. From the latest science podcast, a potential way to keep vaccination campaigns of cattle up and running. I don't know that one, but uh, I know that I, a paper has just come out where they're um, developing a Leishmania vaccine uh, in mosquitoes. So the mosquitoes bite you and deliver a vaccine. I don't know. I think we're way off from that. And there are a whole bunch of issues with uh, people have been kind of toying around with that for a number of years. And then you you open up a whole can of worms with you're going to release a mm. a vaccine that's in the mosquitoes that you can't really control and what happens if you get mutations in the mosquitoes as they breed and nobody's given informed consent to be bitten by a mosquito it's uh, mm, yeah good point 
it's kind of it's kind of difficult to implement, but it's a fascinating idea. Yeah, uh, very interesting stuff. Kind of like opening a can of mosquitoes. Yes. Very good, Vincent. I'm learning from Alan. And last but not least, always of interest to me, working in the biopharmaceutical industry, PCV virus DNA found in rotavirus vaccine. And yes, we did cover that. Yes. Right. Thanks for Twiv and Twip. And Peter is from Korea. Sorry, Peter, we read it so many months later, but we read it. All right, who's next? Is that Alan's turn? Jeff? Oh, I'll take it. Uh, Jeffrey writes, Hi, Vincent. Perhaps I have, haven't listened to a specific twiz of Twiv addressing this. Uh, but what's your opinion on viruses having a role in autism spectrum disorders? And it uh, sends a link um, to a uh, Autism One. Um, they have a podcast which apparently discussed this possibility. Uh, is it possible to have a twiv with the doctor with Doctor Stewart as a guest, uh, who I guess is the person on that podcast? Also, before you speak about the possibility from your perspective, could you also answer what we can test for to rule out viral infections? How do we know what we don't know or test for? Even though I do not agree with everything you speak of, I do find your TWIVs educational. Thanks for the info, as always. Uh, and that's Jeff in Colorado. And uh, Rich, you provided... Uh, I, I, you know, I think there's a good CDC website that... Um well, first of all, the CDC has a good website that describes autism. Right. <clears throat> and uh, as a, if you search within that site for, uh, I forget what I searched for, but viruses or something like that, they talk about the research that's been done to uh, test the possible possibility for a link between vaccines and uh, autism and say that there is none. And very, right. very extensive work has been done uh, in this regard. And we have, I don't know if we've ever de dedicated an episode to this, but we have talked about this at, uh, in several different e uh, episodes from time to time. Yeah, and, and this is, I, I think, uh, I'm not sure if the question was aimed at the autism, at the, at the vaccine autism discussion, which we have certainly talked about. And, and I think, you know, that horse has been beaten long past death, um, that that's that's not where this is coming from <laughs> and in numerous studies um but uh i i read the question as to the possibility of viruses having a role in autism mm -hmm. spectrum disorders and i think the answer there is uh, we don't know right um as the cdc page mentions you know there's the possibility that it that there might be um uh, mitochondrial involvement um but that's very preliminary um we don't know and, they, and the bottom line is we don't know what causes this condition. Um, so is a, is a viral cause possible? Could there be some uh, in utero infection, for example, that combines with a genetic predisposition? I think, I think it's pretty clear at this point there is some kind of genetic component to it. But it's, it also seems that there's, that's probably not the whole story. Um, so it, it is certainly possible that, uh, that there's some kind of infectious, possibly even viral um, agent out there that's involved in some way. It's very hard to tease out. Uh, yes. As we've, as we've learned from the chronic fatigue story in XMRV, right. you know, there we have a virus that was found in a certain fraction of patients, and still we don't know. Uh, we have, we don't know whether it's the etiologic agent, so. Right, and you have to determine, is it, is it associated with the disease first, which, um, you know, in that case, there's a candidate virus that might be associated. Um, and then you still have several more steps you have to go through. You, you have to determine, well, is it associated with the disease bef because um, it's op an opportunistic infection or because of it co-segregates with other problems that are occurring? Or is it actually causative? Yeah. Um, and as far as testing for um, how can we rule out viral infections, I don't think you ever could. Um, no, not at all. You know, you could find some other cause and determine that that other cause is is it, at which point you'd say, no, it's not really a viral infection. But can you rule out the possibility that there is a viral infection at the same time? Uh, never. It's very difficult because even, let's say you took a, a cohort of kids with autism and you'd have to make sure they're well-defined by the right criteria. Right. And let's say you did deep sequencing to find out what viruses are in them. There'd be such right. noise there, right? Because yeah. young kids have a lot of virus infections. So how could right. you ever tease out a causative one? It'd be very difficult. You'd have to have a massive um, 
a, a massive set of cases and a massive set of controls. Yeah. Um, and I suspect all you'd get is noise. Nevertheless, I think this is the kind of thing where, you know, if there uh, metagenomics deep sequencing is likely, it seems to me most likely ultimately to play a role in uh, identifying uh, an infectious agent if there is one. Right. But uh, yeah, you're right. The, the signal to noise ratio is going to be low. Just for the record, Autism One, which is the website he sent, is a nonprofit charity organization, 501c3, started by a small group of parents of children with autism. Okay. And I had not listened to that, uh, to the podcast associated with that, so, or the, the audio, so I don't know anything about Dr. Stewart. Uh, on the other hand, the um, product of the week on the website is a, a DVD by Dr. Andrew Wakefield. So I'm, I'm a little suspect of that. Right. Um, yes, he shouldn't be there. <laughs> and I suspect that's what Jeffrey disagrees with us about. Right. But that's okay. We The world is all about disagreement as long as sure. you don't fight over it, right? Right. Right. Right, Rich. Amy writes, hi, Professor Racaniello. I'm an undergraduate student in your class, and I have a question about episode 67. Of all the extreme sterilization methods that you discussed in this podcast, why is phenol the only one that can alter or destroy prions? What mechanisms does this chemical use to alter the particle, and do you think it is possible to use phenolic derivatives to treat prion diseases, or are they too toxic? So she's asking you this, Vincent. It was part of their extra credit assignment to send a question to TWIV, you know, ah. so any of us could answer it. <laughs> <laughs> my, my answer would be that phenol destroys proteins. Right, it it denatures them. From, from what we can tell, prions are infectious proteins. And so all of the, all the other sterilization methods that people have commonly relied on, re, relied on for um, pathogens that we're familiar with uh, work mostly by breaking down DNA. Um, so if you hit something with bleach, it's going to, uh, it's going to break the DNA and that's going to kill the viruses and the bacteria. Um, but it's not really going to hurt the proteins very much. So your prions persist. Um, phenol breaks up the proteins. It denatures the proteins. As for using that as a treatment, I'm certain that the, um, any therapeutic dose of it would be completely toxic. Right, uh, right. Phen phenol in the lab is in a little bottle with a skull and crossbones on it. Uh, it's nasty stuff. And you know what? If you look at the active ingredients on a lot of the over uh, over the counter cough drops, you know what it is? It's phenol. It's very low concentration. Very, very low concentration. Yeah. But the dose makes the toxin. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think it's used in some mm -hmm. cosmetic applications too. Mm -hmm. Very low. Yeah, concentration. it does. At, at very low doses, it's certainly tolerable. But it's um, uh, at any dose that would break down prions, yeah. I'm sure that that would be since you'd have to get it into the brain. Yeah. The interesting question is why this works for a prion and not boiling and not autoclaving. Right. So I don't know the answer because autoclaving should also denature it, but it's apparently stable to that, but not to phenol denaturation. Right. This must be a very heat stable protein. Yeah. So, so it's different. It's heat versus chemical denaturation. So that's the difference. All right. Who's next? I forgot now. I think it's you. Radhika writes. Uh, another question on prions. How did prions form? Is it just a mutation in peptide structure? Or, or And are there any links between prions and degenerative brain diseases such as Alzheimer's? Well, I guess the first prion was probably a mutation in the gene encoding the protein. It's a host protein, the prion protein, PRP. And uh, the idea, I think, is that it originally started in sheep and that uh, there was a mutation in the gene, spontaneous mutation, that led to the misfolding in the disease, and then it spread among sheep and got into other animals. And in humans, we know there are forms where there are spontaneous mutations as well. Now, are those spontaneous DNA mutations in the coding gene, or is it a folding error that causes the original one to misfold into the pathogenic form? I think it's both. There are both kinds where you have a, a change in the gene, and that's familial, a disease right. it's inherited right. and then there are changes in the protein that we don't really understand yeah absolutely um are there links between prions and degenerative diseases so all these degenerative diseases alzheimer's parkinson's prion diseases even type 2 diabetes 
all involve uh, the formation of amyloid, which is fibr fibrillar protein deposits. In each case, there's a different protein involved. So they're all unified by having, by having amyloid as part of the pathogenesis, but they have different proteins. But there's also a fair amount of controversy around the role of amyloid in, in all these conditions, whether it's, a, um, yeah. whether it's a byproduct of the disease pathogenesis or whether it's causing it. Right. Uh, so there are, there are kind of two camps in the Alzheimer's world. I know there are people who believe that amyloid is, is causing it, and so you try to develop treatments that would break down the amyloid uh, fibers. Um, and there are other people who say, well, that's nothing to do with the cause. The, the fibers are forming because of the pathogenesis, so they're aiming for other, uh, right. other things. Um, but yeah, those are, that's a common characteristic of all of those diseases. All right, Alan, take the next one, please. So Mark says, hi, Vince et al., I was uh, interested to hear you talking about people using calorimetry to measure energies of viral processes. On a bit of a tangent, I wonder if you're aware of a paper published in June 2009 where researchers measured the energies required to cleave the von Willebrand's protein by molecular ma manipulation using laser tweezers. Um, and uh, this is uh, von Willebrand factor, uh, sends, he sends the abstract. Um, it's secreted as large multipers, multiple ah, multimers uh, that are cleaved by uh, this metalloproteinase to give smaller multimers. And um, these folks, uh, what did they do? Um, tensile, for, tensile force on one of these multimers increases with the square of the length. They, they, they stuck a bead on uh, okay. both ends. <laughs> <laughs> they stuck a bead on both ends, and then they held the beads in a laser trap, and they could then pull, Got it. pull it and measure, you know, tensile forces. Right? So they they measured its strength by grabbing it by the ends and pulling on it. Exactly. Wow. Sing, single molecule stuff. Very cool. Yeah, it's neat. Uh, and he then continues, I've long thought quantum approaches could be applied to biological processes. Uh, perhaps that specific frequencies of electromagnetic radiation, such as photon energies, could be applied to enhance or inhibit specific biological processes. Are you aware of any research in this area? Um, there's a fellow, oh gosh, he was working on a treatment for some neurodegenerative disease that applied RF fields to his head. Um, and he started working on this tinkering with some ham radio equipment and, and steel pie plates in his garage. And, and I subsequently, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm only remembering bits of the story. Uh, maybe I'm suffering from the condition, too. I don't know. But, um, but it was just this fascinating little bit of, uh, you know, amateur science that turned into um, neuroscience companies seriously investigating it. And I think they now have a, uh, an, investi an investigational um, application with the FDA and they're, they're doing clinical trials on this. So the idea of using electromagnetic radiation to affect biological processes is not totally off the wall. That's, um, that is something that could indeed work. Mm -hmm. We, we saw a talk at ASV where Ann Simon from the University of Maryland used a similar approach to measure the unfolding of RNA structures. She took an RNA right. and put a bead on each side and physically pulled the bead with a laser, I think, right? That's correct. And measured. Uh, she could then measure when the structures were being pulled apart. So I think it's a very similar application as this uh, with the protein. Right. I thought that was really cool. So this is probably going to happen more and more. I would agree. Yeah. Yeah, as a way of doing science, and then maybe eventually as a way of uh, of influencing processes in vivo. Yeah, I like his last sentence there. Yes, thanks for all that whooshing noise above my head. Oh, that's what we are, huh? Rich. Adam writes, does the fact that Mimi virus and other similar DNA viruses that also replicate in the cytoplasm without directly sending nucleic acids to the nucleus mean that, like the evolution of eukaryotic cells into different species and types of cells from one eukaryotic cell, viruses are also one step closer to moving away and evolving into something we can call a different life form? I see. Is it possible that the, vi that the virus, over the course of time, will keep moving further and further from the nucleus, leading it, uh, needing it less and eventually moving away completely from the host cell itself 
due to new progeny being mutated through exposure to different environments and by picking up more host proteins, machinery, nucleic acid through time. Wow, that's wishing. Yeah, <laughs> really. Well, it's interesting. This gets into the uh, the some of the literature that you have sent me that, uh, Vincent, and that we've discussed that, frankly, I haven't read in detail yet about the role of these large nucleocytoplasmic viruses in evolution mm -hmm. and the notion that they go way, way back and are, in fact, I guess, some sort of um, fossil, if you like, representing very, a very early uh, evolution of eukaryotes uh, and the relationship between eukaryotes and uh, other uh, microorganisms and parasites. Um, I think, well, the notion that these are evolving to become ultimately independent of the host, nah, I don't really, I don't really see it that way. Um, they're their own little beasts that I think are, at least for now, viruses, um, and will continue to be so. So I, you know, the, he raises an interesting point: the notion that you could have something that starts off evolutionarily in a, as a virus and then acquires more and more and evolves into an independent uh, microorganism itself. I, I'd never thought about it that way. That's interesting. interesting. Yeah. yeah, but I yeah. think that the small viruses that are minimal have stayed that way for millions of years because it works, mm -hmm. right? Right. There's no, there's no pressure to get bigger. Um, no. I think they're all filling different niches. Although this, somehow right. Mimi virus ended up that big. Yeah, so, right. yeah. It, so it must have experienced pressure to add all of these things. Yeah, maybe. That's a good and, point, um, yeah. But I don't think that the small ones are necessarily going to evolve to be like the big ones. No, no. The small ones have found their own niche yeah. that works for them. I don't know. This is It's a really good question. Um, I think we need to do a show on this and get a guy or a gal who, who thinks about this stuff. Right. Explain it to us. That might be tough because not too many people do this. Someone else writes, and we don't know who it is. They didn't leave their name. I thought this would be an interesting article to discuss. It covers a study where M13 virus was used to split water, which may be a potential method for production of hydrogen for fuel cells. I know that these aren't the kind that make you sick, but it would be an interesting aside. Yeah, we don't only talk about the kind that make you sick. I hope we're getting that through now. It's just a tagline. This is an article from uh, Belcher et al. at MIT, who we have talked about using M13 for making batteries. And right. uh, the cool thing is that M13 makes, the capsid protein makes oligomers, and you can use that to lay down other things. In the case of the battery, you can lay down metals that give it conductance. And here they used the M13 to lay down a, an array, basically, uh, of, a, um, of a structure it's a zinc DPEG photosynthesis sensitizer, which can then serve to split water. So I don't know exactly how that works at the chemical level. It's a photosynthesizer, a zinc porphyrin. So it's attached to this the coat protein of the phage, and you get an array of them. And so it's very efficient at splitting water. You see this one, uh, Alan? Yeah, I had seen that one. I I like cool little items like that. Um, I uh, I didn't did not have an opportunity to write about it, but uh -huh. uh, so uh, they say here. Although it holds great promise, real world applications present a number of challenges. Water oxidation is risky chemistry. I guess it can blow up. Yep. <laughs> and other things. So I don't know if this will ever see anything, but it's it's a proof of principle, I suppose. Yes. So it's very cool. Thanks for sending that. Now let's see what are we up to here. I guess we should do a few more, otherwise we never right. finish all of them. Uh, Alan, I think you're next. Okay, I'll take this one from Sheldon. Um, uh, if you use Windows and your eyes aren't as good as they once were, you need to zoom in on the page, but that doesn't work for all programs. Using iTunes can be difficult, so why not change the resolution of your monitor? The problem is you have to get all the way into the monitor settings. Wouldn't it be nice to have a quick, two quick launch icons, one to lower the resolution to zoom in and the other to reset the resolution to your normal favorite? That's why this program, NIRCMD, comes in. Search for it, uh, read down for the command for creating a shortcut that changes the resolution, download it, extract it, and a few minutes of playing around, and it works fine. If you accidentally create a shortcut that your monitor doesn't support, don't worry, nothing happens. Uh, he says, now I can read iTunes. So that's from uh, Sheldon in Toronto. And I gather, um, I did a quick search um, 
and uh, it looks like NIRCMD is a is a program that gives command line interface um, to Windows. And mm. uh, of course, if you're on a Mac, you just hit the program in the utilities uh, file called terminal if you need a command line. And if you need to zoom, you just go into the uh, assistive settings and system preferences. But on Windows, this looks like a, a cool little hack to accomplish the same thing. Cool. Yeah, I guess uh, iTunes is kind of small. So yeah. That's good. All right. Thanks, uh, Sheldon. Uh, Rich, you're up next. Jason writes, hi, TWIV fellows. Firstly, my congratulations on a wonderful podcast. Mm -hmm. TWIV is the first podcast I have ever listened to, and now I find it a prerequisite for my daily 100-kilometer, 60-mile round trip to and from the lab. I'm still listening to the TWIV archives, 24 more, 25 more to go, and I intend to listen to them all again just in case I miss something. Wow, there's dedication. Wow. <laughs> I also recommend that our students sign up to your mailing list as I think it is a valuable tool for their education. Anyway, I've been watching the Tajikistan poliovirus importation event, and I have to say I'm concerned. Currently, there are over 200... 70 cases of uh, AFP, that's um, acute flaccid, flaccid paralysis, acute flaccid paralysis, with more than 50 of these confirmed as wild type 1 polio, with more to come, no doubt. Given a conservative, a, uh, conservative AFP to asymptomatic infection ratio of 1 to 100, there appears to be in excess of 27,000 cases of polio infection in a community with a vaccination coverage of around 90%. I would really appreciate, a, uh, appreciate hearing the TWIV team's viewpoint on this. Also, I found this very interesting uh, and concerning. Any mm -hmm. thoughts? Asymmet uh, a, uh, so he gives the reference here to uh, an article entitled Asymptomatic Wild-Type Poliovirus Infection in India Among Children with Previous Oral Poliovirus Vaccination. Keep up the good work, and thank you for helping me keep up to date with viruses and other enteroviruses during my daily commute. Kind regards, Jason. Mm, Jason so, from Australia. So I'm not familiar with these, uh, with these particular cases. So there's an outbreak in Tajikistan, and now it's up to 430 cases of polio since the email came in, 19 fatal. Seems to have come from northern India. The strain came, the virus came from northern India. This was a region that was determined to be polio-free in 2002 by WHO. So uh, the vaccination coverage probably dropped, and a lot of susceptibles were born and now the uh, virus has spread and uh, as he says there's one one case of paralysis per every hundred or two hundred so there are a lot of people infected so the WHO has gone in and does, done mass immunizations on the millions and uh, have seemed to stem it but this is an example of what will happen if you still have polio around it could be wild type or vaccine derived and you don't keep immunizing um, so it could happen elsewhere and there are a couple of good websites that I'll link to. There's a good WHO site on polio, which gives the news about uh, this outbreak. But perhaps more relevant is polioeradication.org, where you can find case numbers. And I think this is very informative. So let's let me get to the the numbers here. Mm, polio eradication. You go to the homepage. You go global situation, global case count. So, so far this year, there are 576 cases of polio. The same, the same time this year, the last year in this month, there were 730. Uh, so we're slightly less. But year to date this year in endemic countries, that is Afghanistan, Nigeria, um, India, Pakistan, 73 cases compared to 539 last year, but in non-endemic countries, 503 this year compared to 191 last year, and that's because of Tajikistan mainly. So we're doing a little better, but it's spread to some new areas. And so this region is, is risking losing its polio-free appellation as a consequence of this. Wow. So that's a big so, problem, yeah. And what's this? Uh, you've talked about this before, I think, uh, too, the... Um uh, infection in India 
among children right. with previous oral polio virus vaccination. What's the story there? So there, they did a study in India of kids that had been immunized with polio vaccine. And they looked to see if they were shedding wild virus, which would come from non-immunized kids in the country who were spreading it. And they, in fact, found that these kids, fully vaccinated kids who were protected against disease, could still shed virus. So okay. um, that's a problem because uh, we always assume that when you're immunized, you provide some kind of restriction to spread of the virus, at least when you get the oral vaccine. You won't be able to. Your gut won't be susceptible, so you won't spread the virus, and uh, you'll confer some protection to anybody around you who isn't immunized. But this is not the case. Uh, a lot of so people even who get in a, it. even in a completely uh, this raises the issue. I'm interested in your opinion on this. That even in a population where the immunization coverage is really very very good, you cannot necessarily expect to displace the wild type polio virus completely. Is right. that right? It, it could still circulate in those individuals. If a strain were introduced into the US, for example, it could be that it would spread in the intestines of immunized kids. I mean, we don't know because it's Indian children versus American or European, so it could be different, but and we need to do more studies. But uh yeah, it could be a big problem for eradication because the assumption is you can you immunize everyone, you stop the spread, but maybe not. And yeah, so it's I, important to note that these kids who were vaccinated are not getting the disease. Right, it's just it right. turns out that at least in India, they're capable of being carriers. Um, and it's I guess it's possible that their their gut immunity wore off over time. It's all, like it's of course, it's also possible that they have um, a co-infection with various parasitic or bacterial diseases or different gut flora than um, than you'd see in other populations. Uh, but for whatever reason, they are capable of carrying the virus in their guts and, and yeah. uh, spreading it. They say additional studies are required to determine the extent to which such OPV vaccinated children participate in the ongoing transmission of wild polio in highly immunized populations and to assess the contribution of waning of mucosal immunity, as Alan has just said. And these folks are yeah. getting monovalent vaccine, right? I think they've gotten both Uh uh, in this study, let's take okay. a look. Let's see. let's see if I can pull that up again quickly. I just closed it. Call it OPV, which is really the trivalent. Right, right, okay. So I think it is uh, the trivalent. And um, I talked to a friend of mine at CDC, and he said that there are a couple of other studies that confirm this, and he thinks it's been known for since the vaccine was developed that it doesn't actually give you uh, gut protection against infection, against disease, yes, but not against infection. So he said, and that's pro that's probably generally true of many vaccines, right? It protects you against disease, but doesn't right. necessarily protect you against infection. Um, you could yeah. it, uh, you could still get infected and undergo maybe a little bit of replication or yeah or or something, but um, sure. Well, so the, that, the immune real. system doesn't protect you against infection, right? If you're immune to something naturally, you're protected against the disease, hopefully, but not. And it doesn't mean that it couldn't replicate at all. Right, right. Yeah, I think that probably will turn out to be the case. I mean, we always thought polio blocked intestinal replication, and that's in fact what I teach. But it's probably not true. It probably is. It's probably reduced compared with unimmunized people, but there is still sufficient replication to spread virus. So that really puts. Uh, uh, a very interesting spin on the whole concept of eradication. It does. Because yes. a, any given vaccine doesn't necessarily, you, know, you the concept, the dogma has always been, at least for me, that if the only reservoir for a virus infection is humans, and if you can then uh, vaccinate sufficiently to uh, eliminate the infection from humans, then you've taken care of it and you can withdraw the vaccine. Uh, and that worked in the case of smallpox. Right, right. Uh, but maybe that's not always going to be the case. I know that you guys have argued this with respect specifically to the oral polio virus vaccine. How about with the inactivated vaccine? Can kids still uh, uh, shed yeah. wild-type virus a if they've been yeah. uh, immunized with the ina yes. inactivated uh, vaccine? Yes. Do we know that? Yeah, we do know that. Now, it, it, some have argued that it's not the case, but I don't believe that the data are compelling. I think that they can they can shed virus even to greater extents than OPV immunized children. 
So in the U.S., for example, where a lot of since 2000 we've been using IPV, I think we have a lot of susceptible intestinal tracts. So if you introduce the virus, it would spread uh, quite extensively in the country. Now, having said that, there there is nonetheless a herd immunity effect in that if people are not actually developing the full blown disease, they won't be secreting it for as long. Yeah. Exactly. It's not black Presumably. and white. Yes. Right. There, there so are shades it's, of gray. It's not, we're not, it, <laughs> right. This doesn't show that herd immunity is not occurring. It just shows that herd immunity is not perfect. Yeah, exactly. It's not as good as we thought it would be. Right. right. So what sort of efforts are being made to uh, assess how much wild-type polio is around in the environment? I mean, obviously, you can look for disease, but that's not necessarily an accurate reflection uh, uh, considering this discussion of how much wild type virus is around. It's like you need to <laughs> do deep sequencing on sewage routinely or something like no, that. No, you don't have to sequence. You can just black assay. It's black so, it out. It plaques so well. And there are some countries that do this. There are polio reference labs globally, and, and we had an email. That's this email from this gentleman. He's, he works in a polio reference lab. And they look not only in samples from people with acute flaccid paralysis, which is the which, which rings the bell that it could be polio, and then you look for virus. But they also look in environmental samples. There is some, but you can't look everywhere, right? It, it's only your conclusion about where the virus is in the environment is only as good as how much you look, and we can't possibly look everywhere, so it could escape our our detection. So I think that you know that's the problem with eradication. You can't assume that you're going to get rid of all the wild vo- virus, especially if it you know, sticks around a few months up to a year in the environment. I uh, suppose the other thing about smallpox that made it sort of the low-hanging fruit of uh, eradication technology is that uh, virtually 100% of people that got infected uh, were symptomatic. Absolutely, right. Uh, so you didn't have this, you, you really knew what was going on. Yeah, and right. here it's 1 in 100 or 200, exactly. Yeah, that's a big Big difference. There. Well, and it also it helps to have a disease where the vaccine is completely different from the virus that causes the disease. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, right. that too. <laughs> that helps a lot. And polio can change into the virus. The vaccine changes into virulent forms. Very now, is that? Uh, l- l- let's stop here for a minute. That I know that it reverts to something more neurovirulent, but is it as neurovirulent as wild type? Is that? Is the reversion of the uh, vaccine strain to uh, is the virus that is the revertant potentially as dangerous as yes. wild polio? Yes, it's as okay. virulent and as transmissible. And as the longer it circulates in people, the the more it becomes almost like wild type. Basically, okay, it doesn't take very long for it to do that. Yeah, and okay. There, a number of studies have shown that. So that's one of the problems with eradication. Right, particularly if you keep using the oral vaccine. Yeah. So, uh, you know, at some point they may switch to the inactivated, which would be great, and use that for, sure. I don't know, five yeah. years or ten years, and then maybe you have a chance of stopping the circulation of these other viruses. But who knows? It's going to be a while, I think, still. Wow, big problem. Yeah, it is. All right, I think, unfortunately, we have to stop and, and move on to our picks, but... um Maybe we'll sooner do do another email episode sooner. You're going to have to because there's yeah. quite a queue here. We got right a lot here. how many emails there were. But these are fun to do. I oh, think, they're right? great. They're it's fantastic. Great. All right, let's do science picks of the week, and let's start with Alan. I'm still scrolling down. Just a moment. Oh, here we go. Yes. <laughs> it's a long uh, list. <laughs> yes. We do have a lot of emails. All right, everybody. We'll get to you eventually. Um, my pick of the week is a uh, science blog called Southern Fried Science which besides having a really fun title um, is a, a, a interesting blog I stumbled on just a little while ago. Uh, it's maintained by three, uh, I think they're all graduate students. Yeah, they're graduate students uh, in fisheries biology. Um, and it, I'm sure Dick would appreciate this. <laughs> um, so they study fisheries, um, how, how people catch fish and how that affects uh, uh, whether we'll be able to catch fish in the future. Um, and lots of interesting science that you might not come across otherwise and very, uh, you know, well-written and, uh, um, pithy descriptions of what's going on. Um, just a, a fun 
research blog that I found. Nice. It's nice to see students doing this. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. uh, It's, it's amazing. These are graduate students doing this. You know, most all too often graduate students are just so sort of nose to the grindstone that they (laughs) wouldn't necessarily, uh, do this kind of stuff, but these people obviously are uh, quite uh, animated free thinkers. It's re- it's really very good for them. It's great. If you were yeah. a student today, Rich, you think you'd do that? Uh, you know, I've often thought about the question of what my life would be like, what I would be like if I were a student today, and I just <laughs> I don't know. Can't I tell. just don't yeah. know. I don't know. I you know. I guess I had quite a bit of enthusiasm. Kind of it would depend a lot on where I was, um, you know how 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 big the whip was, how yeah. much pressure I felt. I don't I, know. I, None of our all, students do this here. I can tell you that. I'm uh, I'm reminded all of a sudden of a quote from James Watson's uh, Double Helix when he says something on the order of that uh, scientists are often most creative when they're at least a little bit underemployed. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if people have, have spare time, you know, maybe some, maybe some spare time is good. Reminds me of the Google paradigm. You know, they tell their employees, we want you to spend 20% of your time doing something that is not your assigned task. I like it. Yeah. Yep. I wish we could do that. Yeah. Well, so I, good for these I, kids. I sort of do that. That's what Twiv. Yeah, and, that's uh, what Twiv is. is about. Yeah, cool. How about you, uh, Rich? What have you got? Okay, so I ran across this uh, website during uh, a recording of Twib once when I was looking up some phylogeny and I was googling around and I found the Tree of Life web project, uh, and it's a a website that is. Uh, building its own uh, phylogenetic tree of everything on the planet. I was particularly interested in this because uh, if you go back, it's got, it's got some interesting navigation, um, uh, little navigation bars to help you cruise around in the uh, tree of life. Uh, but it's got on the homepage uh, a mossy-looking tree with uh, various organisms on it. You can click on those and get to different uh, parts of the phylogenetic tree or all the way back to the most primordial ancestors. And as you follow this around uh, going through the branches of the tree of life, it's got all kinds of stuff, photographs and text and et cetera. Oh, this Uh, is cool. You know, you you click on the the most ancient one. Right. And it says the root, and they have you bacteria, eukaryotes, archaea, and then they have question mark question viruses. Mark viruses. So they don't know where to put right. them on the tree. Exactly. <laughs> they don't know where to put the viruses, which to me is, you know, that's that's a really very interesting question. Uh, and in fact, on that same page, uh, relevant to our earlier email, if you look down here, they say discussion of the phylogenetic relationships. And it says two alternative views on the relationship of the major li- lineages parenthesis, omitting viruses, are shown below, the archaea tree and the eocyte tree. And these are different arrangements of uh, how things might have evolved from uh, the primordial soup, I guess. So Hmm. relevant to our earlier discussion, the important thing is that this is an ongoing discussion. It's not like we have hard and fast answers to this. And it's a very interesting discussion as to how things evolved. But I agree, one of the coolest things is they don't know what to do with the viruses. Uh, relative to the tree of life, and uh, certainly I don't know. Mm, no, no, we, we don't. We don't know where to put them. They're but poly- some of the pictures I've kind of looked through these and looked at some of the pictures and stuff, and they're really pretty cool. It's cool. This looks like it could evolve into a really, really nice site. Nice. Yeah, this site has actually been um, under construction almost since the beginning of the web. I remember seeing it in the late nineties, um, mm. and it was very rudimentary at that point, um, and seemed like a, they had very ambitious goals and. Um, and now looking at it now, they, they've really come a long way. It's very yeah. impressive. It's a big project to undertake. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's cool. Well, my pick is a website called the big think. And in specifically, there is a Dick de Pommier section at the big think, <laughs> which, so the big think is a, um, site, which is basically a forum 
which connects people and ideas. That's how it's built. And if you go to bigthink.com slash Dixon de Pommier, you will see a whole bunch of videos of Dick speaking about vertical farming and uh, urban agriculture and so forth. And since he's not here with us, I thought we could uh, use this as a pick so we can say Dixon. Terrific. You know, I've seen, uh, I, lo I looked at this. I have, uh, uh, for, I don't know that listeners are aware of this. I've never met Dick. I've uh, <laughs> appeared with him on podcasts. I've heard him talk. I've seen pictures of him. But this is the first time looking at this that I've actually seen his face moving with <laughs> noise coming out of it. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> well, if we if all had gone according to plan, he would have been in ASV, but he didn't come. So perhaps another I'll time. I'll meet him someday. 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 Yeah. Well, you have met me. Have you met Alan? Probably not, right? No. No, we've not met in person. There you go. That's, One of these days. It's the way the web is. Yeah. All right. Well, that will do it for another TWIV. And as you know, you can listen to us in several ways. You can go to iTunes. You can go to the Zoom Marketplace. In both places, please subscribe so you get updates right away, and it's all free. And if you go to iTunes, please uh, leave a comment, and it helps keep us on the front page of the Medicine Podcast section. A lot of you have done that, I know, but if you haven't, it takes a few minutes, and it really helps. You can also listen with Stitcher Radio, which is an app for your smartphone. Go to bit.ly slash stitchtwiv to learn all about that. And if you want, you can go to twiv.tv and listen to us or download the episodes. The whole archive is there along with show notes, uh, links for every story we talk about, as well as the letters that we read on the show. Twiv's part of microbeworld.org, sciencepodcasters.org, and promednetwork.com, websites where you can find high-quality science podcasts. And by the way, if you um, have a Roku box, you can now get the promednetwork.com content on that. That is a box that brings the internet to your TV. I don't have one, but that's what I understand. So you can listen to Twiv on your Roku box. So if you have one, check it out. Now you can also buy Twiv merchandise. You want a T-shirt or a mug or many other things? CafePress.com/twiv. This is mainly for promoting Twiv. We don't get very much money out of it, but we'd like to have everyone in the U.S. and all over the world wearing Twiv T-shirts. <laughs> well, maybe not everyone, but a lot of people. If you wear a Twiv T-shirt, people will say, "What is that?" And you tell them, "Check it out." So that's uh, so, Vincent. Cool. You asked me for my home address recently, and while I was away sailing, apparently a package arrived. I haven't been home yet, and my wife uh, emailed me and said, "Did you order something from Cafe Press?" <laughs> so you must have sent me like a T-shirt or something. Yeah. I can't wait to get home and Go see home it. Go home and check it out. I, I actually Far sent out. a couple out, and uh, <clears> thank to, you very much. I'll have to get Alan's address next. Uh oh, I, for, I, I have to do. Yeah, I wanted you to tell me what it looks like. And uh, then if it's good, we'll send one to Alan as well. <laughs> uh, I'm, so I'm the, um, the guinea the pig. You're the guinea pig. pig. Yeah, I haven't even got one myself because I wanted you to tell me how cool it is. <laughs> so, But okay. it's uh, courtesy of TWIV. <laughs> we'll start using these as uh, as prizes and stuff when we have contests. I think that would be cool. Cause right, it, it, so. uh, I've already gotten emails from people who like it and they want specific things. I only put four or five items at the store. And uh, people want other kinds of shirts and so forth. So it's very easy to do that. And if you have some specific request, someone wants a bumper sticker. So um, I'll do it. Just tell me what you want. Well, I'm just looking at this website. I got to get a coffee mug. I'm going to get all this stuff. Look at this. <laughs> a travel mug, a water bottle. Holy cow. <laughs> this is great. Thanks, right. everybody. Alan at alandove.com. Good to hear you again. Yeah, always fun to be here. I loved your post about archiving data on film. Hey, you like that? That's cool. Go over to yeah. alandove.com and check that out. It's a really nice post. I didn't realize that a, fr a single 35 millimeter frame can have so much data on it. Yeah, it is it is a very information dense medium, but people don't think of it that way. Not at all. So it's very cool. Go out, go out and check that out. Rich is at the U. F. Gainesville, home of the Fighting Gators. Good to have you back. Great to be here. You guys both going to be here next Friday? Uh, actually, uh, I'm going to be in 
Texas helping my daughter move in, but I'm assuming you have that the first thing they're going to do is set up the wireless. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to, there. there's a possibility of a problem, but I'm going to figure on being there. I'll let you know. All if right, let a- us know. You have been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Mm-hmm.